Well, I was born uh, not far from here at a Germantown Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, <clears throat> in 1937. And uh, I, uh, my parents lived in Olney, which is just about 15 minutes away from where we are right now. And I've actually lived in that neighborhood my entire life. I've, I've lived in two different houses, uh, but they're just a few blocks apart. And, and I've been there for all this time. Uh, except for excursions on on the road and different things like that, I'm, I'm basically in the same same place where I started. Yeah, so uh, and I went to school there. Uh, uh, I, I went to Catholic school. It was right across the street from my house, so the nuns got to see everything I did when I was not in school. <laughs> you walk out of the house, and the convent was right there, and they could see everything we did and uh, so we had to behave ourselves and uh, uh, but uh, and, uh, I got interested in music when I was in around sixth grade uh, because I had seen a, one of the early television shows this would have been around 1949 or something like that uh, maybe maybe 1950 I don't know but there was there wasn't too much on TV uh, there were a lot of test patterns and uh, you know uh, uh, puppet shows and th things like that, but there was one show. Uh, there was the Johnny Desmond show. Johnny Desmond had been a singer with Glenn Miller Orchestra, and he had uh, gone out on his own and be actually became a pretty well-known singer. And he had his, uh, this little TV show where he would just come out for, uh, I think it was like a thirty-minute show, and he had a group behind him. And he would just do tunes, tunes that we now call from the Ameri Great American Songbook. You know, they were all the standard tunes. And he would just stand in front of this small group. It was a, the Johnny Guaneri Trio, uh, featuring Tony Matola on guitar. And uh, which, which is funny because just on the way over here, I had my radio, uh, Sirius XM radio playing. And uh, it was uh, uh, an old uh, thing with Frank Sinatra and Perry Como, and Tony Mottola was the guitar player. And I was just thinking about that when I heard it like a half hour ago. A anyway, uh, so I used to watch that show, and I think it was on like three times a week. I, I really couldn't say that for sure, but it seemed like it was like, oh, it, that show's gonna be on now, you know. And, and uh, so Johnny Desmond would sing a tune and then the guys would take solos. And, and I didn't know it was jazz, I just knew that it was something that I liked. And I especially liked the guitar player at Tony Mottola, and I decided I wanna be a guitar player, you know. And uh, so I went to my mother and said I'd like to, to, to learn the guitar. And they bought me an in inexpensive guitar that had a picture of Gene Autry on it, so, uh, <laughs> and a horse, yeah. You know. And uh, so, but that was okay. So I went to Zaff's Music Store, which was on Fifth Street and Fifth, Fifth and uh, Tabor. Uh, was there for many years and closed a few years ago. And uh, they had a guitar teacher there. His name was Mr. Chop. Uh, uh, don't ask me to spell it. It's, it's Mr. Chop, and he was he was a European, and he was a classical guitarist and he played the zither and he played the mand mandolin, which he pronounced mandolin. But anyway, so I was in the, the wrong place, you know, I, I, but I didn't know it because this guy was, he was probably a very good teacher, but he was strictly classical. And here, you know, I had in my head, Tony Matola playing all this stuff and uh, it wasn't gonna go in that direction, you know. So after about six months of lessons and I became really <clears throat> frustrated and just kind of wondering like, well, why did I want to take this up? In the meantime, the show had gone off the air. So I, I didn't have any inspiration left for that particular uh, thing and I, I stopped practicing and next thing you know, that was, that was it. Question for you. Sure. What was the address? Where did you live? What was your address where you lived? Do you remember? Yeah, it was 6117 North Lawrence Street. And no, I wasn't named after the street, <laughs> but the street was not named after me either. 
people always ask me that. Oh, are you named after the street that you you live on? Uh, I was named after an uncle who had happened. Yeah, but it was uh, 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 right across the street from uh, there was a Catholic school, a Catholic the, convent, St. Helena's School, and and the and the church rectory was all in one block. It's still there. It's all all of it is still there. And uh, excuse me for a second. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, so a few years later, uh, my brother, who was five years older, he came home and he had a, a record album of jazz at the Philharmonic. And it was uh, real records, you know, the CDs or uh, even LPs hadn't come out yet. So it was a, an album of several records uh, that you could play. And it was of a concert that the Jazz at the Philharmonic Troupe had, had done in Carnegie Hall in 1947. And it had uh, Flip Phillips, Illinois Jaquette, Howard McGee, Bill Harris, uh, Hank Jones, J.C. Hurd, I think was the drummer, uh, Ray Brown, uh, I guess that's it. Uh, uh, and uh, so there was this tune that became famous with Perdido, and uh, Flip Phillips had the solo, and he became famous from his solo in there, and Illinois Jaquette, too. And uh, so when I heard this, my brother playing this record, and I said, what is that? I'd never heard anything like that before. And he said, oh, this is, uh, and he explained to me what it was. And, and he, he was not interested in becoming a musician, my brother, uh, but he did like the music, you know. So eventually I took over the records and I just kept playing them over and over and over again, you know, and I said, wow, this was a real revelation. That's what I want to do. I wanted to play the saxophone and go back to my mother. And she said, well, you already quit one instrument, uh, you know, is this going to be the same kind of thing? You're just So she made a deal with me that, uh, 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 coincidentally, the, at the uh, uh, school, uh, high, I was in high school now, first year of high school, and they had made an announcement that if you wanted to join the band, you could get in and they would lend you an instrument uh, and they would give you lessons. And so I approached her with this idea, and she said, well, well, get the instrument from the school, and if you're still playing a year from now, then we'll buy you a saxophone. So I went to the school, uh, the band director, they didn't have any saxophones. And for some reason, the guy gave me a trumpet, and uh, I, I took it home, and. Uh, and I thought, I, I really don't want to play a trumpet. I went back the next day, and he gave me a clarinet and said, if you learn how to play the clarinet, it'll be an easy thing for you to switch over to the saxophone. And uh, uh, so that was it. At, at the time... Let me ask you, what, um, what high school was it? Oh, this was LaSalle High School. And who was the instructor? The, the, uh, the band director was a guy named Joe... Colantonio, and uh, so uh, the thing at the time was they had a, a, a 90 piece marching band. Now there's a lot of these around nowadays, but then <clears throat> that was kind of unusual because most of those high schools had bands that only they played for at the football games, and when they went out on the field, they they might have done something like to to uh, spell the name of the school or something like that, you know, Go Explorers or something like that. But it was starting the, the trend toward like fancy uh, routines and stuff on the football ball field during halftime. So they wanted to have a band that had a whole lot of people in it. So it was be impressive. And they had all these choreographic uh, routines worked out. And uh, and that was, at that point, that was really what they were pushing for. So they immediately gave me a uniform and a clarinet and said, uh, you have to go to practice after school. And I said, well, I don't even know how to play. It, it didn't matter. <laughs> as long as you learn the steps, you know, the 
choreography. So I, I went and I learned the choreography and there that by that Sunday I was out on the football field doing these routines, you know, and pretending that I was playing the clarinet. And what happened was eventually I, I realized that I could could play the, the melodies of the songs by ear. So I didn't really know how to, to read the part. So the thing is like, you know, well, while the trumpets, which were the loudest instruments, while they would be playing the main theme of a uh, whatever march it was, and you know, and they'd be like, da, 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 da. And the clarinets were supposed to be playing something else. Well, I played what the trumpets were playing, you know. It didn't make any difference. There was 90 people there. <laughs> you couldn't hear me anyway. So, uh, but anyway, I realized that I could play by ear. And I never did become a good clarinet player, but, uh, but uh, I, I stuck at the music, and so my mother could see that I was really interested because by this time I was buying all the records I heard Bird and Diz and all that kind of stuff <clears throat> and so let me ask you something um uh, your dad was he musically involved or no what did no. what did he do for a living he he was a uh, worked in a textile mill uh, he was a boss of uh of whatever I I never learned what it, I, I went I went down there once or twice just to see where my dad worked you know he and he was a wonderful person he was a great guy but he was not musical uh, there not that I ever knew I mean he would watch TV and he seemed to enjoy what he heard but he, he was kind of an old-fashioned guy and uh, but he would never put a record on or anything like that you know and he was very easy going and he just you know but uh, Did your mother work? My mother was a, no. She was a housewife. She she did like music, but she she tended to more toward uh, she she wanted to play the piano, and so she bought a piano, which was a good thing for me. Eventually, this was down the road, but uh, she became sick and she had to stop taking lessons. There was a woman who used to come to the house and give her lessons, but my mother probably she would have liked. Liberace or something like that. You know, she tended to. Uh, I remember one time uh, we were in Atlantic City, and uh, my parents had rented several rooms in a hotel down there. This is before the casinos, and they had these old boardwalk hotels. And it was a holiday weekend. I think it was the Fourth of July, and the whole family went down there, and we went to the. Uh, there was a place there called the Cotton Club. And uh, so this I didn't find out till later. The Cotton Club had a, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but the Cotton Club had a, a show which had singers and dancers and all, this whole review. It was all African-American review. <clears throat> so when we went to the Cotton Club, they made reservations for our family. And we went in before the show started and they had a group playing. It was, it was Chris Powell and the five blue flames. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know any, but anything about that, but I learned later on it was Clifford Brown and Dad Dameron, and uh, I forget who, it might have been Benny Golson, I don't, I don't know. But I, I remember my mother making a, a remark, because Tad Dameron, who I, I didn't know who, at the time, he was playing stuff that, I, and I was digging the whole thing, you know, I was like really into it. Wow, these guys are, and my mother said like, I hate the way that guy plays the piano. <laughs> she, he's just pounding out chords and stuff. Yeah, she liked to hear this real florid kind of, uh, you know. As far as formal instruction on the clarinet, the, the school provided lessons, but they were group lessons. Uh, so I had to go every, you know, whatever it was, Tuesday or something after school for a lesson, but it was a lesson with four or five other kids, and they were all more advanced than I was. So when I went for the lesson, uh, the, the teacher, and his name was Attilio, he, he, he said like, okay, kid, you play that, and I couldn't play. <laughs> you know, so so he, he, he lost patience with me right away, and at one point he said that 
his uh, his expression was, "You can't get blood from a stone." So, so he said, "I wasn't would never be able to play." So uh, when I went to this football game uh, at, at Tilio, he remembered me as this this horrible student that he didn't like, you know. <laughs> Uh, and he said to me, uh, hey, kid, you still play? And I said, uh, yeah, I still. He says, well, if it'll make you happy. <laughs> Those are the lines I, re I remember <laughs> word for word. <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so the problem was with the music that I started to, I, I got so wrapped up in all the music, I neglected my studies. And eventually, I sort of just dropped out of high school, and I went on <clears throat> on the road when I was 18 with Vince Montana. I regret it now, I really do, because uh, uh, the main reason I regret it, I mean, I, I don't feel like I'm a totally <laughs> uneducated person, but but uh, it's what it, it did to my parents, you know, at, at the time. <clears throat> I didn't think that much of it. It was just like, hey, I want, I want to do this, you know, the way kids are. And and when I think back on it, you know, I'm sure that it really hurt my mother because she wanted to, to uh, you know, all parents, they want to see their kids. And, and music is such an insecure thing to go into. At one point she said to me, have you thought about uh, uh, what you want to do? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm already doing it. And she said, well, you don't think you're going to be as good as those guys you listen to on the records, do you? And I said, of course I am. You know. Anyway, but uh, <clears throat> so I went on the road with uh, Vince Montana, you know, Denise's father. Right. And he had a, he had, he wanted to form a, a commercial, what they would call a lounge group nowadays. Then it was just a band. They just, you know, I wanted to form a band. <clears throat> and, uh, so we went, we, we formed this group that had two tenor saxophones uh, and Vince on vibes and we had drums and, and bass. And, uh, uh, and we went out and got uniforms and worked up a routine of tunes and stuff. And then we were on the road. And, and the thing was Vince Montana was a really good vibe jazz vibes player and I had heard him uh, before and he was he was older older than I was and when he said he wanted me to join his band I was really thinking I was getting into a jazz band you know we might play a couple commercial things but this is my chance because I'm going to play with this great vibes player and he really was good uh, but it didn't turn out that way. Right away, we started learning all the like the top forty tunes, and the, by today's standards, they would be gems. But back then, I wanted to play what what Charlie Parker was playing, you know. With it, and we were learning all these other things that were current hits in nineteen fifty five. I was going to say this is about nineteen fifty five. Yeah. Right. So rock and roll was starting. To come in. Elvis Presley had just started. To, yeah. So uh, it was, uh, I, I felt at some point that I was kind of sidetracked, like, you know, we were out doing these jobs and playing in these clubs, and basically the people didn't want to hear jazz. They, they, they wanted to hear what you're, you know, some rock and roll or different kind of commercial music. And, uh, uh, and it stayed that way for a long, <laughs> a long time. Even after I left Vince's group, it was, going from one of those kind of groups to another. And I just, I thought like, well, this is not what I started out wanting to do, uh, you know. Uh, Where's your tour? Hmm? Where did you tour? Where'd well, it's mostly around uh, the East Coast, uh, uh, mostly in Pennsylvania, like Hazleton we would go to, and York, Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, we'd stay for a whole week, mm -hmm. you know, we'd, a week or two. Every place had a couple of clubs that had those kind of bands. And in those days, you, when they booked you, they would book you for a week or two. And so we'd, we'd go and we'd check into a hotel and we'd stay there 
and play every night from nine to two in the morning. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, we, we go to uh, Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, all those kinds. And then eventually the furthest trip we w went, we wound up in uh, Savannah, Georgia for, for five weeks. And then that's when I decided to, to quit. Now how much, uh, how were you, tra were you traveling in one car uh, and how much were you getting paid? It was, we traveled, uh, from what I remember, in two cars, I think. Uh, uh, Vince had a car, and then uh, there was this, uh, I, think, I think it was, uh, uh, Franny Lavinia was the other saxophone player. He's a good friend of mine, even today, till today. And uh, I think he had a car. But I don't remember too much about that. I just remember going there. And we got paid very little. It was like around, a, 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 I think it was $120 a week or something like that, you know. I remember that most weeks we started to run out of money, you know, so uh, uh, it was, the, the pay was not good. Uh, and then, uh, you know, after a while, I, I really didn't enjoy the, the music. It was, and, and uh, and it wasn't like we were getting rich or anything like that. And then there were some uh, uh, problems with people in the band getting into arguments, uh, stuff like that, you know. Uh, so it, it ended. Uh, and then I went back, to, came back to Philadelphia, and it was more of that kind of playing. But I tried to keep up my jazz chops by going to jam sessions and, and things like that. 